Oh, 
good evening. Uh, we're continuing this study on Sunday nights, uh, just going through what we referred to last week as the heart of the heart of the Bible. Uh, I had a professor at Harding that said that Romans is the heart of Scripture, and then he said chapters 4 through 8 are the heart of the heart. And so that's really what we're going through uh, on these Sunday night uh, assemblies, virtual assemblies for the next several weeks. Uh, these are a little bit different than the lessons I've presented in this format in the past because I don't have sermon notes in front of me, just my Bible along with some notes that I've, I've written in the margin. Uh, because actually what I'm going through with you is, is very useful in going through evangelistic studies uh, because it really does present uh, the basis of our salvation in its purest form. I think that's why, what, uh, why so many people gravitate to the book of Romans. It's why I love the book of Romans as, as much as I do. And so we looked at last Sunday night at, at chapter 4. Uh, tonight, notice the first verse of, of chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to think for a moment just about that word, Peace. Think about the most peaceful place that, that you've ever been. Maybe it was at the beach someplace as you listened to the, the ocean waves roll in and felt the sun on your face. Uh, maybe it was up on a cool mountaintop and just enjoying the, the view and the beauty of, of God's creation and the cool mountain breeze. Maybe you think of some other uh, times and occasions in your life when you were especially relaxed, when you were at at peace. And we long for peace. One definition of peace is just the absence of war, the absence of conflict. It means that, that conflict is over and so we could be at peace. But then there's another type of peace and that's internal peace. It's, it's the peace that we feel within ourselves. And it's a peace that, that many people are lacking in their lives. They never feel at, at peace with themselves. I found that even some Christians, people who wear the name of Christ, are lacking inner peace, maybe because they're trusting in the wrong things for their salvation. And so as we look down at, at verse uh, verses six, or I'm sorry, verses eight through ten. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved from his life? And I, I want you to notice these phrases. Christ died for us, verse 8. We're justified by his blood, verse 9. Also in verse 9, we're saved from God's wrath, through him. And so notice where the emphasis is. The emphasis is on Christ. We're saved by his blood. We're saved from God's wrath through him. Uh, we are justified by his blood. And so the, the emphasis, again, as we saw last week, as was the case with Abraham, his faith was credited to him as righteousness because he put his faith in God just as we put our faith, as we put our trust in Jesus and Jesus' blood uh, to save. I want you to consider the story about an orphan lamb and, and a shepherd who was, who was very much attached to this lamb of his. And, and because he, he wanted this cherished pet to, to live, he tried to get a, a ewe sheep who had a lamb of her own uh, to accept this orphan, but she rejected it. And so after all methods ha had failed, the shepherd slaughtered the ewe use, use sheep's own innocent lamb. She removed its hide. She put that hide over, uh, he put that hide over his own pet lamb. And when he took it to the ewe this time, she, she smelled that familiar scent of her own offspring. And she accepted this little lamb as, little orphan lamb as her own. Well, you might hear a story like that and think, I, I don't like that story. That That's not fair. That's not right. And nevertheless, that is what God has done for us. He loved us so dearly that he allowed his son to die for our sins. And then on our acceptance of, of his son, we then are clothed ourselves with Christ so that we have entrance to, God, 
to God so that we can ourselves be accepted by, by God. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 64 verse 4 or verse 6 says that, that our sins are like filthy rags before him. I mean, nothing about us that would make us acceptable to God other than our being clothed with Christ, finding salvation through him. Listen to these words. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And now notice the lesson from Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and this way death came to all men because all sin. All includes you and me. That, that's you. That's me. That's everyone else. Everyone who lives or has ever lived. Who is the one man who is mentioned? Well, that that is a reference to Adam. Let's continue reading now in verses 13 through 14. But before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, the pattern of the one who is to come. And so what was the, think about this, what was the first law given to mankind? Well, you have to think back to the Garden of Eden and, and that first commandment that was given to Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. What was the next law given by God? It was the law, the law of Moses given it uh, on Sinai. And, and if the people who lived before Moses were not under any law, why did they die? Well, they died as a consequence of, of Adam's sin. Uh, almost as if, if you get into a game of, of gambling and, and uh, you think there's a good chance to win and you bet high, but you lose and you lose your salary, and you lose your home, and you lose your car, and you lose your possessions. Well, well who has sinned? Well, you, you've sinned, or I've sinned if it, it was me that's involved in that. Well, who pays for that? Who suffers as a consequence of it? Well, the entire family suffers. And we didn't disobey God by eating that forbidden fruit, but we suffer the consequences of Adam's sin as members of Adam's family. And verse 14 says that Adam was the pattern of the Christ who is to come. We might die as a consequence of Adam's sin, and not just because Adam sinned, because we all sin. You know, all of us are, are guilty. But the good news is that we might live as a result of the righteousness of the Lamb of God, who is Jesus Christ. And the righteousness of Christ is a gift. God desires to give each of us that gift through Jesus, his son. As you know, as we read this passage, I want, I want you to notice how many times the word gift is used here in Romans chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. So, so here's the passage. Just listen to how many times that word gift is used. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life to all men. So you notice how many times that word gift is used in that short reading. Yeah, I, I've preached and I presented in personal Bible studies the, the book of Romans in this passage many times. And, and uh, on one occasion I, I presented this and, and the person that I was speaking to, it struck them for the very first time that salvation is a gift. It was just overwhelming. They, they said, Keep this, this is too good to be true. This, just, this can't be. Well, the gift is not like the trespass. And to underscore the, this reality, Adam is compared to, to Christ. As the consequence of Adam's sin is death, if the consequence of Adam's sin is that death entered the world and we all die, but the gift of Christ is not like the sin of that first man. Adam was a sinner. Christ was absolutely righteous. And so while Adam's sin led to death, 
the righteousness of Christ offers eternal life. What, what a contrast that is. The contrast between death on one hand and eternal life on the other. And we didn't choose to be born as human beings. However, we can choose to make Jesus the Lord of our lives. And so Adam sinned, which led to death. But it, that's not, the gift is not like the trespass. Jesus Righteousness leads us to eternal life. Adam's sin brought death. The righteousness of Christ brings eternal life. And then Romans chapter 5, verse 19, 18 and 19 sums up the contrast between Adam and Christ, saying this. Consequently, just as the result of one tra trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. And so Adam committed the one trespass. Jesus provided the one act of righteousness. Adam's disobedience made many sinners. Christ's obedience will make many righteous. And then Romans chapter 5, verse 20 explains further. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Sin cannot overpower God's grace. Well, you might conclude at this point that since salvation is totally dependent on Christ because his righteousness makes me righteous, I'll accept his righteousness, I'll, I'll receive this gift, and I'll just live as I please. I'll, I'll just do whatever I want. Let, let, I'll sin, and I'll just let grace cover it. Grace could pay the bill. But the only problem with that is it, it won't work. We're going to talk about that a little bit as we get into chapter 6. But I want you to think about uh, tonight. What, what does it mean to have peace with God? Where does God place the focus in Romans chapter 5? On, on the sinner and the sinner's obligation to, to self or to Christ and his provision of salvation? Can a gift be earned? Is, is, God's, grace, is God's grace really sufficient to cover every sin? Do we really believe that? And what does the Bible say? And how is one act of righteousness capable of covering every sin. We're going to talk a little bit more next week about some of the objections uh, to this, uh, some of the ways that people might take and abuse God's grace and, and why that can be problematic. We're going to talk about that as we get into chapter 6 next week. I care not today what tomorrow may bring, your shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain.
with songs of praise we mortals sing below. And though it takes the parting of the ways, yet I must onward go. I hope to hear throughout a number days the song that cannot know. They sing in hand a new song of Moses and the Lamb. I want to hear the angels sing to bid me run to welcome to me to mansions from the mansions fair. I want to hear the glad hearts sing with voices, voices blending, oh so rich and rare. Sing. 